Welcome to episode 9 of the Seasoning the Reasoning podcast. I'm Harry Sewell. My guest today is Smita Thoreau. Smita and I work together on a number of projects. Smita is a motivational keynote speaker and thought leader on unconscious bias and how it influences all of us. Smita has spoken at conferences all over the world from Philadelphia to Penang with Berlin and Bangalore in the middle. She talks about emotional resilience, change management, leading in times of uncertainty and other similar topics, all embedded by our unconscious. She is founder of Thoreau Associates, a training, coaching and organisational development company and co-founder of Cultural Analytics, a company that uses artificial intelligence to understand culture in an organisation. She is a TEDx speaker, broadcaster, trainer, coach, mentor, mindfulness practitioner and associate lecturer. Smita runs her own series of podcasts, Stories of Unconscious Bias, one of the top listen to podcasts in the entire world. Hello, Smita. Good to see you. Good to um, see you thanks, too. Thanks for joining. Um, so I know in our prep, we said we we're going to explore unconscious bias, and I'm really looking forward to having a conversation about that. And, um, you know, I guess in the course of it, we'll talk about how we met and why we're in communication about unconscious bias at all. Um, but I was really uh, interested in an area of overlap that you're probably not aware of, which is in your conversation, um, I can't, was it Sitan? I think it was, when you were talking about your experience of having growing up in India and then living in this country and how that made a difference to your experience of the world because you hadn't grown up with those limitations um, in terms of your aspirations. It's so mirrored what I talk about. Um, so it's kind of documented in other things I've done on online when I gave an example of when I'd been in this country. So I was born here, went to Jamaica from five to 15 and came back. Um, so in my first or second job, a poet called James Berry, um, Caribbean poet, um, he came to do something in Oxfordshire and he spent you know, quite a few hours with me. And at some stage in the afternoon, he called me to one side and just said, you weren't born here, were you? Um, and I said, well, I was born here, but I lived in Jamaica, but why do you ask that? He said, there's just something I can tell. He said, you, there's just something assured about you. He said, you know, it's so different for the kids who are born here and don't know home. Um, and as I heard you on your podcast talking about that, I thought, wow. Um, and the way I summarize it, and this is such an indictment really of our society, I summarize it as this, it wasn't until I came to England at age 15 that I realized that my aspirations were too big. Oh, uh, that's a bit depressing, that last sentence. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, and, <laughs> but and, I, I didn't have that, uh, that level of, of um, shock as you did. I'm using the word shock to, to denote what the realization that you'd had. Uh, because I think I didn't come at the age of 15. I came at the age of 21. Oh. Uh, and I came after my undergrad. Right. And so I was even more fully formed in inverted commas than you were at age 15. Mm, yes. And so I came with a very, very clear sense of my own identity. Mm, mm. Um, and I didn't actually question. And I also fortunately came in the 80s. I think it's, it's a question of luck of age and uh, calendar year, because I know people of my age who, who grew up in this country, age 15, 17, 18, in the 70s, and they would have had a very different life to me, age 15, 17, 18, growing up in Calcutta in India. Uh, and that really is so much about our narrative, our unconscious bias, who we are, how are we defined? Indeed. Yeah. And, and for me, that notion of you know, the kind of aspirations, because in Jamaica, I really believed that I could do anything. And, um, you know, I remember when I was younger and someone said to me, what do you want to be um, when you grow up? And I said, a, a governor. And I didn't know exactly what a governor was. Um, there was a, a chap, Florizel Gladpole, I think his name was, who was the governor general. 
and I thought, yeah, you know, he was a man of stature, and I really thought, yeah, I want to be a governor. Um, and <laughs> I, I go on to tell the story that my aunt is married to the Governor General of Jamaica now, um, which kind of amuses me. Um, Sir Patrick Allen is in fact my uncle. And you have an uncle, hooray! Right. At least you can touch the governor. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so I, do, I do go to King's House when I'm in Jamaica, but unfortunately I have right. to leave. I have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned earlier about unconscious bias and, um, you know, I know through our work in Bradford that that's an area of um, knowledge and experience and expertise you bring in. I was just curious as to what brought you into that field of unconscious bias. What you just said, Harry, um, if I were to just summarize what you said, but very, very slightly differently. I arrived in England, uh, fully formed in inverted commas in my 20s, um, with a very confident sense of my own identity of who I am. It doesn't matter what I wanted to be. I, I wasn't as mature or ambitious as you were perhaps uh, at the age of 21. I wanted to be, I was interested in broadcasting, but that's by the by. But then I arrived here and I met many people who looked like me, who did not have the same experiences as I had had uh, growing up because they were born in this country. And I also met many people who didn't look like me, who would ask me questions like, where did you learn to speak English, for example? And I, and I don't speak any differently today than I did when I arrived. This is how I spoke growing up in Calcutta. I mean, you may find it amusing, but we were really into elocution and, and, my, and you know, my school was run by Irish Catholic nuns who taught us how to enunciate and pronounce our words and all this nonsense. So, I mean, it was fun and I liked performing. So I enjoyed learning to speak properly, if you know what I mean. And so when people ask me, where did you learn to speak and how come you speak English or whatever else, I was amused more than insulted. I was genuinely bemused and amused, actually more bemused. I wasn't even amused, I was more bemused. And then talking to, to people who looked like me, who had very different experiences to me, I began to realize how naive I was when I arrived in this country because talk of culture shock, I had studied English literature for my undergrad. I had no issues about the history of the United Kingdom. Uh, I'd studied all that in school. I knew a lot about literature. I could quote words and poems and probably know far, far more English literature than many of my friends in this country. But what I didn't know was about the divisions, the, 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 um, um, the sense of one's own identity, the lack of opportunity, the sentence that you said, that I came with a dream and then, you know, I'm paraphrasing and of course you realize you couldn't achieve that dream. I didn't have that realization. I came and I started looking and the more I looked and spoke and explored, I felt, gosh, this is about us and our stories and how we are brought up. And so I'm talking about a long time ago, this whole idea of, and I didn't use the word unconscious bias, that's now become fashionable. Those days we didn't use those words. Um, I began to be aware of the fact that who we are is very much defined by our life experiences and how we reflect on them and how we manage them. And my very first job was for the Granada leisure industry where they had um, these bingo halls and I was the area personnel and training officer and I would drive around to these different bingo halls and manage training plans for the management trainees for the junior ones, because I was young myself, I, you know, not the senior guys. And I remember talking to them about things like time management and um, being a better manager and being a better leader and so on. And it, I said, it's always down to our motivation. And what is it that's stopping us from doing X? What's our story? And so if you think about the bigger headline of unconscious bias, it's very much what is our story? And how much are we influenced by the stories around us. It could be a movie we see, it could be uh, the country you live in, uh, it, it could be anything, it, I mean, you can throw anything at me and I can, I can kind of give you a reaction to that. Um, you know, even time management, it could be that I, as a child, hated writing essays. Now I'm a manager and I've been asked to write the strategic report and I always fail my essays because my teacher was really bad in school. As an example, I'm making it up. Uh, and. And my manager says to me, please complete this you know, strategic report and give it to me next Friday. And I've got a whole week to deal with it, but I keep finding excuses not to do it. 
And then I think, I have no time. I've got back-to-back meetings. And on Thursday afternoon, I'm freaking out because I haven't written the strategic report. It's about our unconscious bias influencing us without us realizing it. So, and you are smart then, because of course, when people, uh, as you always are, <laughs> um, but people often think of unconscious bias as pertaining to race um, or gender or sexual orientation. And of course, what you've highlighted of, is that it relates to all aspects of our life. And as you said, right, you know, at the start, we're shaped by our experiences and there are aspects of that shaping that's outside of our awareness. And that will pertain to, you know, whether you like writing reports or whether you're a data person or not. You know, some people think, you know, I'm just not a maths person. And there's a part of their brain that shuts down and you know, they become a manager and they've got to manage a budget and that part of their role freaks them exactly. out. You know, all the same reasons that you talk about. I wondered though, whether or not the language of unconscious bias somehow removes the, the responsibility, the accountability, and whether or not it denies the actual agency that individuals have to push back against the things that have shaped them. See, the thing is, um... At what level, I completely agree with you. But when I'm talking about unconscious bias, I think rather than pushing back, which is the words that you used, about what's going on, and I'm not taking away from what's going on in the bigger world. I don't mean to, I'm not continuing to be a naive 21-year-old. I hopefully am a little bit more grown up since then. But I still am idealistic, and I know that of myself. I do believe that most people actually don't want to be racist or biased or discriminate deliberately. There are there are a few who do, but most people do it without realizing to what extent their own stories have influenced them to react the way they do. And therefore, I think it is important for us to first challenge our own selves, our own stories, our own narrative, our own experiences, and come to terms with how we are reacting to situations. And once we've begun to be comfortable in our own skin, in our own identity, only then can we now start thinking about the bigger words like systemic, institutional, X, Y, or Z, whatever it is we're talking about, and explore, engage, and, and see how we can try and affect change within those arenas. But we can't try and affect change in those arenas without first coming to terms with who we are. And so it has to start with ourselves. That's how I feel, and I feel very strongly about that. Yes. Oh, you know, indeed. And, you know, the idea that it's an ongoing process, that it's a practice, um, because we live in a world that will continue to shape us in a particular way. Exactly. And that kind of reflection and awareness has to be continuous. I wondered whether or not in our minds we have, well, I know we have clarity um, about a definition, what unconscious bias is. I wonder whether or not you feel that in our conversation and the illustrations we've given to our listeners, if we've been clear enough as to what a succinct definition of unconscious bias might be? I mean, simply put, it's a preference for or against. For or against. Okay, that's the, that's the crucial two words you must remember because a lot of people think it's against. I hate you, I don't like you, you're black, whatever, whatever it might be. Whereas I love you, I think you're amazing, you're my best friend. I, I grew up in Jamaica, so anything Jamaican is amazing. It could be a positive. So for or against, and not just an individual, it could be a whole institution, it could be a, a country, it could be a food, it could be a thing, it could be an inanimate object. But it's, and then of course, that's a bias. And then when you put the word unconscious attached to it, it is that I don't know that I have that opinion, assumption, judgment for or against sex. And the reason I don't know is because literally, and if this is being shown on a video, it's as quick as clicking your finger like so. The brain is moving that fast that you are not even aware that your finger goes, your brain goes like that and you jump to X conclusion, for or against. Yeah, and, and linked to that, and it's an aspect when I do my work on unconscious bias with groups, I often talk about training, but often I think I'm facilitating people's like developing awareness as opposed to training them. Um, but one of the things I often um, reflect back with them is, the, the fact that often we have biases that we don't actually endorse. And I think, you know, people find that such an awakening when they hear it to kind of realize actually, this is kind of part of the dissonance because things might be manifest in our behaviors, 
that don't even fit with our value base, but to a certain extent we're reenacting things that may have become normalized, you know, through the society or through our own experiences. And yeah, it might actually be contrary to our values. I wondered, you know, whether or not in your well, then that then you connects you, see, Harry. Because if it's normalized and it's become habit, and it's therefore our unconscious bias, we have not questioned it. We have accepted it as normal. You know, uh, since 9-11, there are a lot of people who may not have experienced any kind of personal terrorism, terrorist act, and yet might see a South Asian man with a beard who looks like he's a practicing Muslim and wonder whether the man is a terrorist. Split second I'm talking about. Yes. I'm being deliberately provocative when I'm saying that. And they've normalized it without even questioning it. It's not because of experience, it's because of the society that they're living in and what people are saying. So it comes back again to what I was saying. You've got to first reflect, you've got to first question, you've first got to be asking yourself, what's your story? Why are you jumping to those conclusions? And if we have not begun that self-reflection, then we will continue to normalize stuff without questioning it. No, indeed. And um, I, I love your example. And I wish I could give the reference for this, but I remember reading and in fact, um, citing it in one of um, the things I've written, an author was saying, a uh, um, head teacher at school, I think in Birmingham, received complaints about this influx of Muslim um, children to what was a Roman Catholic school. And, you know, they started to complain and the head teacher was like really curious because their admissions policy wouldn't normally have kind of allowed that to happen and discovered that they were South Asian Catholic people. Um, but the parents, the other parents had seen um, these folk in the, the playground dropping their kids off and had just in their minds jumped from oh, South Asian to Muslim and, and it became a complaint. But yeah, another example of how, you know, the unconscious bias process Absolutely. is at work. It's without a great people. example. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, one assumes that they weren't being malevolent intentionally, but um, biased nonetheless. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a classic example, isn't it, of unconscious bias? You know, the, 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 the Catholic parents of this country, white, I'm assuming, predominantly, maybe black too. And now there's a whole bunch of South Asian children coming in. Um, and they know that the school, I mean, the school sort of constitution or whatever the word is, only has Catholics in it. And they're making assumptions just because of the color of the skin. I think that's brilliant. Great example. Yeah, I'll, I'll search that out. So, when you do the work on unconscious bias, um, what kind of techniques and um, you know, approaches do you use? And I ask that because I, like you, am aware that the evidence base suggests that you know, reductive unconscious bias training doesn't really shift people's awareness to an extent that it shows up in their behavior. So I kind of wondered, based on your experience, what kinds of things actually work for people who are listening thinking well no good it's a great question i mean especially on the back of, of mps and so on saying unconscious bias training we can't be bothered with it and xyz we read about all of that of course um and i and again and what i do with with my participants and you're so right it's not training it's facilitating who am i to be a trainer i mean you know i'm just and i always say that i, I say right at the beginning this is literally a sort of a toe in a vast sea Please don't expect for you to complete this two, two and a half hours webinar, which is nowadays online, two and a half hours and think that's it, tick that, I'm done now, I no longer have any, it doesn't work like that. Um, this is actually literally the first tiny baby step in exploring and understanding this topic for yourself. And I always give them further exploration for them to go away and read up and explore on their own if they're interested because each of us have to manage our own journeys on understanding this, this, um, this idea of what's our unconscious bias. And what I do is I put them into breakout rooms and I get them to share stories, their own personal stories. And that is so, so powerful. And that is why I started my podcast because I've been doing this for a few years now and within closed doors in, a, in an institution, you know, X organization that nobody else is hearing, I was privy to these amazing stories. And I said, my God, if other people could hear these stories and realize how thoughtful, how wonderful these people are. You know, just the other day, um, I, I had a webinar with, with, uh, with somebody and the gentleman deals with customer service. And so he, his job in a government organization is to be there front of house and any one of us, you and me included, could go in there 
and possibly complain about something. It's a council government office is what I'm saying. I don't want to, I mean, it's a compliment, but I don't want to go into more detail. Um, and, and, and this gentleman, he, I was so moved by him because he said, every morning when I come in and it's such hard work, what I do is I wipe the slate clean. And when people come and speak to me, I really try not to jump to unconscious bias conclusions about why and what their story is and why they're coming to me. And every once in a while, I pull it up short and I, and I, and I remind it that I shouldn't have thought what I did. And it's hard doing that. And to me, I thought, wow, you, oh, you know, he's a role model. Yes. He really is. That's the kind of person we need who constantly yeah. challenges themselves. But it's easier said than done. No, indeed. And it sounds as though you have um, a capacity to believe in possibilities of human beings. Um, Idealistic. Can you not see a tattoo on my forehead? <laughs> no, I, I honestly, what's the point otherwise? I couldn't work in this arena if I wasn't. Because, I mean, the, the whole point of unconscious bias is for all of us to think and become better human beings. I know it sounds horrendously cheesy, but I actually mean that. Because you've got to. What's the point of just waving a stick and talking about all the different isms that are prevalent around us? You know, we've yeah. got to try and change in our own tiny little way, try and change things and make the world a better place, however cheesy that sounds. Well, no. And I remember I was speaking with Otto Sharma and I was saying, you know, some of this work has close resonances for me with a spiritual practice, at least insofar as I'm trying to be the best version of myself I can exactly. be. And exactly. whatever it takes to do that, I'll do that. Even if it feels uncomfortable for me, um, it's part of my growth. But that's the point, you see, because if you really genuinely, genuinely with capital G, want to be the best version of yourself, you will have to be very brave and very strong and a willed character who really manages. And that's not easy. Mm -hmm. And all of us will let ourselves down once in a while because easier to do that. But once in a while, if we can try hard, like that gentleman in that, in that particular council of doing customer service, works very hard at being the best version of himself. That's what we have to try. I'm particularly interested in um, the hidden part. So of course, as you say, it's outside of our awareness. That's why it's unconscious bias. And how does one attend to something that we can't see, we don't know it's there? Um, so how do, how do we work on ourselves? I think to begin with, it would be really trying to reflect when you've jumped to a conclusion. And when post, uh, post COVID, when people are managing to socialize again and meet strangers or sit in the tube or bus or whatever, you could just kind of play a game maybe. And I, because it's a very safe place, right? And you look at somebody opposite you on the tube and you jump to a conclusion, because that's what we do. And then as soon as you jump to that conclusion, ask yourself why. And it's only with you, you yourself, and you are sitting quietly on a 15 minute tube journey and wondering what kind of conclusions you were having about some person you never really exchanged two words with. And, and what does that mean? And what is your story that makes you think that? And is it something that you might have read or seen? Is it something that you've experienced? Because often the hidden parts are not often, but can be, the hidden parts could be something that is deeply traumatic that you've hidden because you don't want to face it. That is scary to then face. You know, it could be something you were bullied when you were 10 years old and the, the trauma was so bad, you've hidden it away. I mean, the phrase that I use is I put it in my backpack and I don't know that it's behind me and I go with it in my backpack wherever I go. Mm. And But then to take your backpack out and open the zip and look inside, is a brave thing because you shove stuff in there from a long time ago and you really believe it is there to keep you safe. But if you've thrown stuff in there purely because of 9-11, you know, the example I gave and people, the society saying something and no personal experience, then you've got to question it and take it out and flush it down the toilet. So it depends on what's in your backpack and who are we? We don't know what any, anybody else's backpack, uh, but we, we know of ourselves that we might have had a difficult growing up years, we might have had trauma stuff which we don't want to think about. Then how, what do you really have the courage to check out those hidden parts? I don't know. And I wouldn't have the right to tell you to. 
it depends on us, each of us and our stories. One of the things I often suggest to people is that they explore different norms that, you know, if they read a particular kind of novel, try and read something, a different genre. If you watch a particular kind of movie, try and watch something that tells a story that is outside of what for you is your norm. Um, and, you know, so you probably know that there is kind of the evidence emerging that, you know, when you have people who are in social groups um, who experience prejudice and discrimination, if others are exposed to positive images of them that has that capacity to shift their biases. So I can't encourage people to, you know, find stories and to not just still go down the normative route. So I often say, you know, watching Black Panther might be really entertaining, but it it's still a Hollywood movie that, you know, when I kind of talk about you know, Black, whatever that is, stories, find some indigenous movie, something that tells a story that isn't about the typical Hollywood arc, you know, because in real life, the stories just run out. You know, someone was building a house and they were hoping to do something and then they perish before they get to that point and the house remains unbuilt. I mean, that's what life can be like. Um, whereas Hollywood often kind of tries to have that ending. Um, so I often say, you know, even the appetite we've developed for that kind of, you know, creative arc is a fabrication. And just trying No, to you're so right. And in fact, I say, if, you know, so what I, what I was, in fact, I did quite for shot in the tube thing. Let's imagine you go to somebody's house for, for some social gathering. I mean, in the future, obviously not now with the lockdown three or whatever we're in, but at some point you might be in somebody's home with a bunch of strangers and, and, and so many of us might go and talk to a stranger and then you think you have a good instinct. I don't like that person. You know, you just feel that in, inside you. Oh, I'm not sure about this person. I don't like. Instead of walking away from that person, what I say, stick with it. Challenge that instinct because you've got nothing to lose other than half an hour of your time talking to a stranger. And try and listen differently rather than proving yourself right, which is your confirmation bias. So, you know, little places, gentle ways of trying to play around. Don't make it, don't berate yourselves, don't beat yourselves up, don't make things hard for yourself. Because the whole idea of understanding unconscious bias is to be gentle, to genuinely explore, to be curious, to listen. So, yeah. In, in my um, training, Smita, I often say um, that if you really don't believe in unconscious bias, go home, um, or if they're at home now because it's online, go to your front door and get some parcel tape and tape over the peephole um, because it serves no function. Ah, well said. <laughs> exactly right. Well said, yeah. Because yeah. yep. nowadays your friends are likely to give you a text to say I'm on my way and I'm outside. So, you know, if you hear the door and it's your friend, you know who that is. So the only other purpose is for you to peek through and make some judgments about individuals. Um, and when I say that, I can kind of see people looking a bit startled. Um, but yeah, they get the point. Exactly. No, brilliant. <laughs> so, you know, this is a question I wanted to ask you um, without suggesting that you'll endorse any particular you know, author or material, but what have you read or watched or, um, yeah, who have you spoken to that's really influenced your grasp of unconscious bias and kind of understanding in a deep way? The short answer is, if, I, it's not about books about unconscious bias. People, during my, my workshops, often people ask, can I make suggestions like Blink and Thinking Fast and Slow and so on, yeah. which I'm sure you know about, uh, which are all books about challenging the, the way our brain works and thinks. But I think in terms of how I am influenced, for me personally, and my understanding and, ex and understanding of unconscious bias is really about just reading, reading novels, watching movies, go to the theatre, talking to people. It's about the culture, about the world around us. And, and being genuine, that's my personality, I realise on myself, being genuinely curious. So it isn't about a book or a text, which of course, they, as I said, there are examples I can give you, or, or a test to do like the in prison associate test. It's all of that's out there that help us understand something better. But I think, I mean, certainly my podcast makes these suggestions because I ask uh, I ask all the, the participants after I've interviewed them, you know, how do you manage your own unconscious biases? What do you do? And each of them says something slightly different. So one person in the, the most recent uh, interview that I posted, who was a historian, says travel. 
He says, it's about travel. And he said, you don't need to have money. Today, of course, it's COVID. So forget that for the moment. In a normal world, whatever normal looks like, and we're allowed to travel. And you know, you can go on a, on a budget. You don't have to be flying business class and going to the Caribbean or whatever. You can be traveling cheap. But when we travel, we go away from our own comfort zone. We're going to places that we never, we've never been to, we don't know. We're going with having no clue, but we want to go. That's why we're there. So the motivation is there. There's one example. If you really don't care, you know, if you're flying, you're not going to get in a plane. Books. Just go to your local library and borrow books, like you said, and get different types of books. Read and say, oh, I didn't know that. Podcasts. Listen to all kinds of different stories. I know I was hearing a podcast earlier on this morning where I learned something about the Maori people and the tattoos that they, they do on their face, which is part of their culture, and how... Um, the masks are made from these faces in the old days after the person died and how the British stole it during colonization. Now, for me, that's a, it's a new story. And I think I know so much about colonization, but guess what? Not enough. Right, yeah, and yeah. so you're learning yet again. So I think it is genuinely about being curious and open to, and I think you just said that, and, and I'm just reinforcing what you said, rather than specific books or anything. Yeah, and you know, for me, the starting point often is that preparedness to say it is it is possible that in this particular situation I was being biased. Um, because the defensive part of ourselves wants to jump in and hence my question about the dissonance um when we don't actually endorse the things that we're thinking or doing in our behaviors, that the defensive part wants to go, Oh no, I couldn't possibly be, you know, I've read loads of books, my partner's black or you know, um I'm gay myself so I'm not but you know someone might say I'm gay myself so how could that be homophobic or whatever it is um you know someone might say to come back with something defensive and I often kind of say you know maybe the practice is getting used to saying knowing what I know about unconscious bias there is a possibility that that could have been homophobic or that could have been sexist or that could have been racist not because I intended to be but I know the language I use, the concepts I use, may well have. Listen, I did it. I'll give you an example of my own sexism. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm holding my hand up and confessing um, because that's the point, you see. I mean, you and I have been working in this area for years. We're not perfect. We will still make mistakes. And um, this was last year. So I was, I was in, a, you know, in a very serious car accident. I'm fine, fortunately, and I've survived to tell the tale. And my, my son, who's age 28, two different friends of his, came home and gave me a bunch of flowers. And I was very touched. One was a girl whose name is Paula. One girl, woman, whose name is Paula. And one was a man named Ben. Both 28, similar age to my son. And after I got the flowers from Ben, I said to my son, gosh, I'm so impressed that Ben gave me those flowers. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, and he said, yes, absolutely. But then the minute I said it, I said, yes. I can't believe I said that. That was such a sexist thing to say. How come I'm not impressed that a woman has the wherewithal to buy a bunch of flowers and give it to me, but I'm very impressed the 28 year old man does. I mean, what is my expectation of men of that age then? Yes. Is my question of me. What is my unconscious bias? And I'm working on it, okay? <laughs> but there, but the, do you see where I'm going? Yeah, and it, it really is. And we will still make mistakes, you and I both. Yeah, no, indeed. It's, what yeah. it's, it's life. Yeah. And when I do my work with groups, I always say, I'm not standing apart from you. This isn't about like, you know, I've arrived not at the sure, exactly. right place that I'm on this journey with you. Um, so to kind of wrap up, I thought it'd be really helpful for us to um, just touch in um, on the Brad for Everyone work. Um, so just to kind of contextualize, um, you know, how we got to know each other. Um, and yeah, I guess our listeners might be interested in, you know, the fact that Bradford Council had put out that request for um, you know, providers of unconscious bias training, you know, with a couple of phases. And, you know, we collaborated on phase one. Um, you led the kind of last part of that, um, you know, which was to, you know, first of all, find some organizations in, in um, that area and to, you know, see who would be interested in understanding their cultural footprint. Um, do you want to just say a, a tiny bit about that? And then, yeah, um, absolutely. Phase two is going to be. Well, Absolutely, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Really exciting. yeah. But before I start with that, I'm going to just say something else, which is, which would be very interesting for our listeners, uh, that that Harry and I are good buddies. 
We've been working together for good, give or take 18 months now. I've lost track. But guess what? We've never met. Of course. <laughs> we have never met. We have only ever met on Zoom. And I don't think you even remember that. But I, we, we know each other so well that we don't realize we've never been together in the room together. We must address that next year. But anyway, to come back to, to what you were saying. Um, so, so no, we, we've been, it's been quite interesting because what we did first in, in phase one is we, we uh, my company also has an artificial intelligence platform that explores culture and behavior. And therefore, instead of working with 50 people, you know, 30 people in a, in a training room, what we did is we took five organizations with X, you know, hundreds of employees and we used this AI platform uh, and gave, asked them all the same questions. And, regard, and with that, we then got a, a proper cultural footprint as to where specifically those organizations want unconscious bias training or any other kind of training to build on and become a more strong or inclusive community. So I was very excited because you and I worked together on that, Harry, and you, because you're Bradford based and I'm London based. And in fact, I was locked on in India for some of the time too. Right. You, you actually went, and before lockdown and you met people face to face and you spoke to them and you discussed what, you know, what we're going to be doing, which is very exciting. And then I think the result of that, what we've got now are nine uh, workshops uh, that came directly from the, the, the people's mouth for want of a better word, mm -hmm. because they completed this questionnaire. We looked at all the different algorithms. We looked at the patterns that came from these five organizations. And we now know what kind of things are required to help them build stronger communities. And so that's phase two coming up and you and I hopefully are going to be doing more work on that because all of these workshops, and I think you'll agree with me on that, will have, doesn't matter what it's called, it could be called emotional resilience, it could be called uh, coaching practices, it could be called uh, having difficult conversations, I'm coming just three from the top of my head that I remember on that list. But all three, without understanding our own unconscious biases, we are not going to be able to have difficult conversations or become more emotionally resilient or become a better manager or learn to coach or whatever any of the other headlines are. Mm -hmm. And so that really is stage phase two or two and a half mm -hmm. where we, we will plan on that. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, no, um, and it's great. And it's lovely hearing you describe it again for those who think, you know, unconscious bias work is something intangible and, you know, a little bit, um, nebulous to kind of hear the you know cultural footprint work and you know it's actually grounded in something empirical I think exactly it's very important um, and especially the engineers will tell you oh, yeah this rara touchy feely stuff what is this nonsense we don't want to know so the engineers are listening and thinking oh hang on a minute did you say artificial intelligence yes i did <laughs> oh, yeah oh, fantastic well thanks ever so much no it's a pleasure area always to talk to you and talk with you yeah, it's been a, a great pleasure. Thanks, um, and I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Exactly. Take care. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, what a pleasure having those conversations with Smita. It's kind of very interesting when you've got two people who are grounded in the same subject, exploring ideas. And it's very clear when we talk about unconscious bias that whilst acknowledging that we're seeing these things emerge outside of people's own awareness and therefore outside of their intentionality, acknowledging that people still remain accountable, but also that at the same time there needs to be compassion in there. Uh, it's kind of a very interesting subject and I hope you found that interesting. If you want to explore any more of the Seasoning and the Reasoning podcast, please do search for Seasoning and the Reasoning on your favourite platform. I hope you continue to enjoy. Thanks. <laughs>